of Adolf Eichmann. If you go to a library and find Holocaust books, you will be very, very hard pressed to find a book about the Holocaust printed before 1960. Because of my family connections, I was very interested and I remember having one book, one of very few, it was called the, simply The Holocaust by, I think, uh, Nora Levin. After the Eichmann trial, we have an explosion, quite rightly, of Holocaust literature. Prior to the Eichmann trial, uh, his capture and trial, those survivors were very reluctant to talk about their experience. Well, before I get into the lecture, I, I, I just want to give you two sort of ironic symbols of, of the Eichmann trial. First of all, and capture. First of all, oh dear. <laughs> I'm not having a good start. It's all my fault. Got the wrong binder and everything. All right. It's an extreme irony of Jewish history that Eichmann, standing in front of the three judges, and they were all German Jews. They all, all spoke fluent German, and so there was no problem with translation with what Eichmann. Here is Eichmann standing at attention before the symbols of the Jewish state, the menorah and the flag, and he says to the three judges, Your Honor, may I please ask a question? If you think about that, this is a man with a wave of his hand that was condemning tens of thousands of people to their death every day. And he had to ask question, and it was a procedural question. It doesn't matter what the question was, so don't ask me that. It was a procedural question. Your Honor, may I please ask a question? This was the first televised trial. Um, there was no German translation. During the trial, it was broadcast live every day on Israeli radio. They didn't have such good television then in Israel. And very staunch Israeli radio correspondents who had been through a couple of wars already in the makeup of the state, several times during the radio broadcast, this Israeli correspondent broke down and cried. And I just want to tell you a personal experience that always stuck with me. They didn't have satellites then that could relay the television from Israel. They didn't have uh, anything like that. So we didn't have anything live. But every week, they would send a kinescope of the trials. It was a primitive VHS tape, I guess, in New York. And they broadcast it. Now, my father is a typical Polish Jewish story. He was the only person out of two brothers, four sisters, his parents, and numerous other relatives. He's the only one who survived. He was lucky enough to be in Canada. So my father wanted to watch this with great intent. And as a child, I, I never really realized the depth of his loss to lose his two brothers, his four sisters, his parents, and other relatives. And Every Sunday afternoon, it was broadcast live on television, or not live, on kinescope. And my father would lay down on the carpet in front of the television. He was a bit hard of hearing. And he'd be crawling along the carpet. And I thought he was going to crawl right into the television. So that is my personal connection. And as I mentioned before this, Holocaust was really rare, rarely written in literature. So here we have three pictures of Eichmann. Young, look at the difference, how threatening he is as an SS officer. And he was born March the 19th, 1906, and he was hanged, executed June the 1st, 1962. And let's have the next picture, please. Here are the three judges. Uh, Yitzhak Rabi, Moshe Landau, and the president of the court and the chief judge, Benjamin Halevi. And the next picture, please. And then during the trial, he asked this question. Now look at this man 
And you could see how Hannah Arendt, which we'll talk about at the end, how she would really characterize me. He doesn't look like the same kind of person. He looks like a timid person. And this is a man, as I said before, with a wave of his hand, he was sending tens of thousands of people to death. Okay, the next picture, please. And again, this point that I really want to make, standing before the state symbols of Israel, the menorah, and he's asking your honor to please ask a question. Okay, and the next picture, please. He has been called the architect of the Holocaust. If it was a corporation, if the Nazi SS was a corporation, he would be the chief operating officer. He was very good at arranging train schedules and all the logistics that went with that. And the next picture, please. A few weeks ago, we had a discussion with a woman and she really wanted to argue about the bombing of the camps. And as involved as I am personally, I really take the position until 1944 in Hungary, none of those Jews were gonna be saved. And you could see the timeline, the vast majority of the people that were killed were killed in 1942 and 1943. And Medanic, a small, these were the six uh, camps. Medanic was a, a work camp, but mainly uh, a death camp, 78,000 people. Auschwitz, 1.1 million. And the other four camps, Kaumno, Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka. Uh, all killed 155,000, 600,000, 250,000, 850,000. Treblinka was especially a horrible place. It was built especially to kill the Jews of Warsaw, probably my relatives and many of your relatives. They were taken every day in a train car and they went from eight to 10,000 people a day. Uh, a noted Russian war correspondent. The Russians were the first to liberate the camps. All of the camps were in Eastern Poland. Uh, President Obama once made a terrible mistake in calling them the Polish death camps, meaning their location. Uh, the Poles took strict coverage, and that's a whole other discussion which we can get in later. What was the complicity of the Poles? It's a very complicated situation. Uh, most people just stood by. Five or ten percent actively collaborated with the Nazis, and maybe another five, ten, fifteen percent actually saved Jews. So it's very complicated. Okay, uh, I think I've made my point with that. We'll have the next picture, please. Auschwitz was a mixed place. If you go there, and I've been there twice as a tourist, thank God, it, it's an enormous edifice. It's really hard to describe. There were 100,000 people working as slave labor, many of them dying at their work. And the bunks, take a look at the bunks, how these people were crammed in. And of course, <coughs> the famous symbol, Arbat Mach Frey, which is the thing. So, it's also important to note, we Jews were not the only victims. The first people killed at Auschwitz were actually Polish clergy. The Nazis immediately, when they occupied the country, the western part of Poland, remember we had that divide, where the eastern part was occupied by the Russians and the western part was occupied by the Nazis. Well, they immediately identified those Polish clergy and intellectuals who could be troublesome, they sent them to Auschwitz and they killed them. Then they began to experiment with the poison gas cyclone B and the SS uh, used Russian POWs. And again, that's another whole story. Almost four or five million Russian POWs were killed during the war, most of them by starvation, but many tens of thousands were used as guinea pigs to test out the poison gas. Okay, we'll have the next picture, please. 
great job by Marnie Packman. His initial life, he was kind of a failure. And it's the same with many Nazis. He was born in, so was born in Solig in Germany. And he, his family later emigrated to Linz, Austria. And coincidentally, Linz, Austria is the place where Adolf Hitler was born. Uh, there's been just some recent articles about Adolf Hitler's house where he was born and the municipality is having a great deal of difficulty. They don't want it to obviously become a shrine, so forth. I think it's been torn down. Anyways, Eichmann invents this assembly line process in Vienna. And at that point, they hadn't yet decided what they were going to do with the Jews. This is 1938, before the World War II starts. So they processed these Jews. They came in, and it was Eichmann's process. He allowed the people in the front door. They had to sign away all their belongings, and they fell out the back door, and many of them were uh, able to get out to those few countries in South America, like Bolivia, Argentina, uh, and other places where they could emigrate. Very few really made it out. Okay, and the next picture, please. And this is Austria. And again, this is a map of World War I and the central powers were Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Bulgaria, and Turkey. Uh, so Austria, they speak German, and many of the key Nazis, Eichmann and Hitler, for example, were Austrians. And we'll have the next picture, please. And this is Linz, Austria, where Eichmann moved there as a child, and was also the birthplace of Adolf Hitler. Um, it was here uh, as a teenager and a young person that the first stirrings of the fanatical anti-Semitism that Hitler had were in Vienna. And he saw some Hasidic Jews, and he wrote in his Mein Kampf, horrible, disparaging things about Jews. And it was there that his anti-Semitism was incubated. Okay, we'll have the next picture, please. So we have Eichmann and Hitler in the same town. They never met. And here is Eichmann's class picture. And we have the blue arrow pointing to him. I should also mention Eichmann. He absolutely deserved to die. Don't let me confuse you. But it's, it's hard to pinpoint that he actually physically killed. He probably shot someone somewhere, but they really don't have any explicit record that he actually committed murder himself. But he, the architect of the Holocaust, designed the killing machines and enabled the Nazis to kill so many of our people. And we'll have the next picture, please. Eichmann marries Veronica Leibel, March the 21st, 1939. Memorize that date, it becomes important. And this is his young son, Ricardo. Ricardo, you can tell from the first name, he was born in Buenos Aires. And we'll get the next picture, please. This is Horace Eichmann, one of his other sons. He was born in 1940. And the next picture, please. You can trace Eichmann's career. And again, I want to emphasize, as a person, he had two or three jobs before he joined the Nazi party and before he joined the SS. He was a failure. He wasn't much uh, a rising uh, star as he was in the Nazi party. And that was true of many of the Nazis. They were failures in their life, but they became stars. So Klaus, his first son, was born in Berlin in 1936. Horst, you saw his picture, was born in Vienna when after the Anschluss, when Germans took over uh, Austria in 1938, Eichmann destroyed the lives with his assembly line process of stripping whatever wealth the Jews have. And we'll have the next picture, please. Dieter Helmut was born in Prague when Eichmann was rounding up and destroying the Czech 
Jews. And Ricardo Francisco was born in Buenos Aires in 1955. Eichmann, I think, got there in 1952. Eichmann is making a secret new life for himself. And we'll have the next picture, please. I'll get myself into the picture. Here's a family friend of the Eichmann family, Ernst Kaltebrunn. He was a member of the SS, and he guided Eichmann into joining the SS. Eichmann joins the Nazi party in 1932, and by the mid-30s, he's part of the elite SS. And we'll have the next picture, please. Oh, okay. Eichmann joins, and if you think about the name of the Nazi party, the National Socialistic German Working Workers Party, it's kind of an oxymoron how something could be nationalistic, socialistic, and a workers' party all at the same time. But that was the Nazi party. And in April 1932, he's assigned to be the SS. SS members all had a number, and they had their blood type tattooed on their left arm. And that way, the Americans and the French and the British were able to identify some of the Nazis after the war. Uh, was over. And the next picture, please. So he, Eichmann joins an active duty SS regiment. He got on from the ground level of Nazi persecution. And he saw an opportunity for himself. He'll become an expert on Jewish affairs because Hitler, from the very beginning, he had written in Mein Kampf which was written in 1923 when Hitler was in jail for attempting a coup in, um, in Munich, Germany. Um, so Eichmann decided he would make it his specialty, and that was his specialty, Jewish work. January the 30th, 1933, the same day that Franklin Delano Roosevelt is, is inaugurated in the United States on that very same day, Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. It was a minority government, but it didn't take very long for the Nazis to take control. They had a fake fire and so forth and so on. And here in this picture, you see Hermann Goering and Hitler reading this parade under Hitler's office. And the next picture, please. And this is Dahl. One of the first places, now Dachau was not an extermination camp. It was in Germany itself. Many people died there, shot out of hand, beaten to death, and so forth. Eichmann got his grounding in Dachau, which was in Germany proper, and he was in the administration staff in Dachau. And the next picture, please. Eichmann goes to Palestine in 19, British Mandate Palestine, 1937, and he's trying to investigate, will we be able to get these Jews in? Now, what happened was, it takes power as we saw January the 30th, 1933, they immediately, many Jewish people, people like Otto Frank, as we know, he fled to Holland in 1933, many others fled, some stayed, but, and approximately quarter of a million Jews managed to emigrate to Palestine. And then the Arabs rioted. It was almost a civil war between the British and the Arabs with some Jews, Jewish participation. So two or 300,000 Jews do emigrate to Palestine. And Eichmann goes there and he gets tutoring from a rabbi. And he begins to understand the Jewish holidays. He masters Yiddish. Now, I know German and Yiddish are so close, but he masters Yiddish and so forth. And he gets his title, an SS Untersturmführer. And the next picture, please. He tried to go back to Palestine a second time, but would not admit him. His concept and grasp of Jewish things was really a frightening thing. 
frightening omen of things to come. He becomes, as I said, a student of Judaism, learns our customs, and that became an unfortunate tool in his hands. And the next picture, please. In occupied Poland in 1940, the Jews were forced to wear the Star of David. And that was just before an eminent Jewish holiday. And this knowledge that Eichmann had was to further frighten the Jews. We have to remember, while there were many secular Jews in Poland, most of them were at least traditional. We would probably call them modern Orthodox. And there were, of course, many Hasidim and people like the Good Israel Party, which uh, survived as the religious party of Israel to this day. So you had a spectrum of Jewish uh, identity with the religion, but Eichmann used this to terrorize the Jews. Okay, and the next picture, please. I want you to look for a moment on the man, the, the only gentleman that you can see his face. Look at this man on the extreme left. His hands are up, and you see the Nazis there. And you can see the look on his face and it really epitomized the, the absolute terror. They, sell, they sealed the Warsaw Ghetto before the war in 1939, before September the 1st, when the war starts, 400,000 Jewish people lived in Warsaw. And they waited till 1940, an Arab Yom Kippur, they sealed the ghetto. And if you go there today, you can see portions of the wall that surrounded it. And this terrorized the people. This was one of many things that he did. And the next picture, please. This is the Umschlagsplatz, the railroad station in Warsaw. And they had by, by this time decided to send the Jews of Warsaw to Treblinka. Eight to 10,000 Jews were sent from the Unstrad class to Treblinka via the railroad. Uh, one of the ways they found out, some of the Jewish order police, these were Jews that saved themselves by being policemen for the Germans, some of them went down to the railroad and they looked at the serial numbers of the boxcars. You know, every railroad boxcar has a serial number. And the Jews were supposed to be going on a voyage to the east where they'd able to work and sunshine and so forth. They all had to bring a two days ration and all their valuables, which of course the Germans stole when they were exterminated. At any rate, some of these Jewish policemen noticed that the serial numbers of the boxcars they would go out one day, and the next morning they'd be back. So Treblinka is quite close to Warsaw. So they realized something was up. Then a few brave Jews who were put in these boxcars managed to pry open the floorboards of the boxcar, tumble out, make their back, way back to Warsaw, and warn the Jews. And of course, not everybody could accept this. This, this beleaguered the mind. How could these Germans, who had occupied Warsaw incidentally in World War I and were rather civil, brutal but civil, how could they be murdering us? It can't be possible. At any rate, they began the deportations from Warsaw to Toblinka, which was entirely a death camp. There was nothing else there. It simply was a facade to make people think that they were going to have work and so forth. So the deportations of Treblinka take place July the 22nd, 1942, Arab Tisha B'Av. Okay, and the next picture, please. Eichmann is made, I won't even attempt to pronounce it, he's made a colonel, and he's made head of Referat 4B4 of the Gestapo, and he was the recording secretary. So he is in charge of all the planning and logistics of the Holocaust. And the next picture, please. Well, 
when the Germans invade Eastern Poland, which was under Russian occupation, and I've explained in previous lectures that the, the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact had divided Poland into two, half the Eastern part under Russian occupation, half. Stalin made that deal because he thought he could have a buffer zone, but the buffer zone proved, proved worthless because of the German blitz. At any rate, in the initial fighting of the German invasion of Russia, June the 22nd, 1941, Germans just poured in, they wiped out tens of thousands of many millions of Russian soldiers, prisoner and so forth. At the same time, behind the main German army, behind the main German army, the Wehrmacht, there were four battalions of men called Einspapfuben. And their sole job was to murder Jews. And they would come to a place, for instance, Kiev at Babi Yar, and they took all the Jews to a ravine or a place like that that was out of the way, and they shot them. It's estimated of there are six million people that were killed, maybe a million to a million and a half were simply shot. But it became quite clear this mass shooting was very hard on the shooters. People couldn't stand. It was very difficult. It was inefficient. It was impractical. And people were finding out about it. Pictures were taken. Some German soldiers took pictures of these massacres. So. That was impractical. They had another idea, the Madagascar plan. France had already fallen. Madagascar was a colony of France. Maybe we'll send all the Jews there on ships. No, that didn't work. Forced immigration to Palestine, but the British won't let them in. As I told you, I wrote a book about that called Blockade. Well, we have this terrible issue. What are they going to do? So the next picture, please. They had to have a final solution. Well, here's a picture of Wannacy, and I've mentioned again the movie on HBO is called Conspiracy, very worthwhile watching, no bloodshed. Eichmann's appointed the transportation and minister of the final solution, and he's in charge of rounding up millions of Jews. And this is the villa, it was probably Jewish owned before the war. <coughs> Excuse me. The conference was supposed to be held in December 1941. It ended up being postponed because of Pearl Harbor and Germany's entry into the war. And let me just digress. One of the probably most fatal mistakes that the little corporal that Adolf Hitler made was when the Japanese launched their surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, and naturally the next day, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Congress declared war on Japan. It was Adolf Hitler and the Germans that declared war on the United States, not the other way around. And there's a lot of thought by some historians that maybe the Americans wouldn't have participated on the, in the European front. Probably they would have, but Hitler really made himself bad mistake, a terrible mistake. Thank God for the freedom of the world. And the next picture, please. Here we see, and if you can look closely at this map, you can see there are six places with skull and crossbones. You have Treblinka, quite close to Warsaw, between Bialystok and Warsaw. We have Sobibor, and Madonic near Lublin. We have Belzec just a little south of that. And we have Pelmo off in a corner and uh, near, near Lodge. And uh, you can see the map. And again, I just want to explain the river that's running from Hamburg down through, it's called the Bug River. And initially when the Germans and the Russians made their pact on August the 22nd, 1939, which made World War II possible, this river was the dividing line. Okay, and we'll have the next picture, please. So, again, I just want to emphasize for the six camps with people, the sole purpose, except for Auschwitz, which was a mixed-use camp, the sole purpose was to murder people. 
There were many other camps which were work camps. We have to also understand that almost 7 million German, uh, no, use the wrong statistic, almost every German male was involved in the war. Hitler did not believe in having the women work in the factories, so there was a tremendous labor shortage. So the Germans went ahead and they simply took non-Jews from places like France, Poland, Ukraine, and, and took them under brutal conditions into these various work camps where many people starved to death and died. Okay, let's have the next picture, please. So Eichmann, he supervised the roundup and extermination of Jews from the farthest reaches of Nazi-occupied Europe. We forget the Germans occupied the Channel Islands right near Britain. And unfortunately, it's a sad story, there was a book written about it, the British authorities in the Channel Islands cooperated with the Nazis. Vichy France. France was split into two. The part bordering the Mediterranean became Vichy France under Marshal Patin. Basically, they cooperated with the Germans. Uh, the mixed uh, issue in France. Initially, the authorities cooperated with the Nazis in deporting the Jews to Auschwitz and the other places. But when they initially cooperated, when they were French immigrant Jews, because of World War I, you had a lot of Polish Jews that immigrated to, to France. So when they began to try and deport French-born Jews, the French resisted somewhat, somewhat. And as a result, the percentage of Jews that were killed in France was only about 20%. On the other hand, there was more collaboration in Holland. 85% of all Dutch Jews, including the Frank family, except for Otto, were exterminated. Uh, Belgium, Norway, Denmark, North Africa. At one point, Eichmann even had some Jews from North Africa flown to nearby to Auschwitz so they could be exterminated. Greece, all of it occupied Eastern Europe. Eichmann was in complete charge of all of this. And the next picture, please. When somebody wants to argue with you about the validity of the Holocaust, the map that we're seeing of Kos. This is a little island quite close to Turkey. A good swimmer might even make it, swimming a couple of miles to the mainland in Turkey. It was occupied by the Germans. There were 500 Jews left. The younger people either swam or rode their way into Turkey, which was neutral in World War II. There's 500 Jews left. It comes to Eichmann's attention, there's still 500 Jews, mainly elderly, and some people that wanted to stay with their parents. They're left on this island. So what did the Nazis do? They sent barges. Now, by this time, it was 1944. There was only 500 left. The German Navy is really somewhat destroyed. The Allied forces, the British and the Americans, have complete control of the air. Russians are winning the war on the Russian front. So, nevertheless, he expended all these resources of sending some barges, and they filled them up with the 500 Jews in the island of Kos, and they took them to the mainland of Greece. They took them to Piraeus, the port of Athens, and uh, during this horrible journey, the sun was very hot, people died on the barges, many people fell into the water and drowned, Whoever was left was taken to Piraeus, and there they were offloaded and put on the trains and sent to Auschwitz to be exterminated. That story is one of the stories of the Auschwitz, of, uh, I'm sorry, of the Holocaust, that really gives uh, an underscoring of how obsessed the Nazis were. The Nazis were the type of people, and it's a German trait, unfortunately, once you start something, 
it never stops going. It was like a perpetual motion machine. So what I'm trying to convey here, we have a war that they're starting to lose. Nevertheless, they're going to spend all these resources, barges and trains to kill these 500 Jews on the island of Kos. Okay, the next picture, please. Heifman's final destination in all this was in 1944. He sent to exterminate the Hungarian Jews. I don't know if Gordon is with us, but Gordon and I have had endless debates about how the Jews could be saved. And I referred to it earlier in the talk. Mm. So we are hungry. We have about seven or 800,000 Jews in Hungary. And luckily, by this time, there's some allied cooperation, and Rao Wallenberg is sent, with the cooperation of the Americans, he's sent to Hungary to try and save the Jews. And Eichmann, this is the one place that they could have perhaps saved Jews, because by this point, they had the air cover to bomb the railroads, to bomb the camps. It's only at this point, but as I mentioned previously, vast majority of Jews were already dead. Wallenberg meets Eichmann because he knows Eichmann's in charge. And he says, look, you're losing the war. If you listen closely, you can hear the artillery, the Russians, the Soviet Union, they're coming. Why don't you get out and go home? And Eichmann says to Wallenberg, my job isn't finished. There's too many Jews left here. I have to destroy them. Okay, we'll get so that again talks to the obsession of Eichmann and all of the Nazi party with the Jews. Next picture, please. Eichmann survives the war. He's captured by the Americans. He's almost identified. He uses a name, Otto Eckmann. He runs away. He flees the POW camp. And it's interesting, I, I just finished a uh, preparing a talk on Mengele. They were, it was very similar. Mengele was also captured, but they, they got away. He hides in various parts of Germany. He's a rabbit farmer. He's a forester. He hides out. He knows he's a wanted war criminal. In 1948, he gets a landing permit for Argentina. Unfortunately, part of the Catholic Church, and it was called the Rat, the Rat Line, a Franciscan friar helps Eichmann escape. He adopts the name of Ricardo Clement, and he gets to Argentina in 1950 by ship. Okay, and the next picture, please. Here we are. He's arriving in Buenos Aires, and we have the next picture. This man, a Jewish man, he had survived the war in Germany. He's the chief prosecutor for the West German state of Hess, and he made it business to pursue war criminals. Incidentally, I just want to refer back to the movie Conspiracy. At the end of the movie, they delineate each person that participated in this Wannacy conference. One of them was killed in action, but most of them, unfortunately, in the immediate post-war in the West Germany, which was democratic, most of them got very light sentences. Very few, one or two were hung. Eichmann, of course, was eventually captured. Anyways, Fritz Bauer gets a letter from a Jewish man called Lothar Hermann, and he's writing him about this man, Ricardo Clement, and he believes he's Eichmann. Let me just pause, I'll tell you what happened. It's unbelievable, this Jewish man had an attractive daughter called Sylvia. Sylvia, by coincidence, was dating one of Eichmann's son, who bragged about his father. Eichmann kept the name Ricardo Clement, but his family still used the name Eichmann. So Sylvia comes home to her father and tells her she's dating this man called Eichmann. And her father was a big wheel in the Nazi and SS party and bragging. 
Eichmann also made a terrible mistake. He was so happy with his job about the Jews that he bragged about it to a right-wing Dutch journalist who published it. So Fritz Bauer is putting together this information and they send a top-notch, Israel sends a top-notch police investigator and he goes to visit Lothar Herman. And he's talking to Lothar Herman about his daughter dating this man and so forth and so on. And he hands Lothar Herman a paper and he realizes Lothar Herman is blind. And this top Israeli police investigator thinks to himself, what kind of case have I got here? An old blind man who refuses to admit he's Jewish thinks his daughter is dating one of Eichmann's son and he's blind. But to his credit, he pursued it. And the next picture, please. So, how did Lothar Herman break the case? The daughter dating Eichmann's son, the son had a lot of anti-Semitic, and by the way, Lothar Herman by this point completely was assimilated, didn't, although he had been tortured in uh, Dachau, he never even told his children he was Jewish. As I mentioned, the son had the name Eichmann, and there was articles written, and so forth. So the police investigator from Israel strongly suspects Ricardo Clement is Eichmann. And we'll have the next picture, please. And I got to thank you for recording this. <laughs> it's very helpful to me. Now, it's interesting. There's a lot of rivalry in Israel. I was just watching the movie Seven Days in Entebbe. Everybody wants to be the person who suggested it. Simon Wiesenthal, and I have the utmost respect for the man, he did marvelous things. He suspected and wants to take credit for finding Eichmann. Other people, so in Israel, this is a typical thing. When something goes well, everybody wants responsibility and take credit. When something doesn't go well, what's the expression? Vic victory has many sons and, and defeat is an orphan. Well, that, that's the case. So the Mossad now, begins to close in on Eichmann. And the next picture, please. They send the daughter with a gold-plated lighter, and she's to find her date, and they move. And the house, this is only the remains of the house, Baldi Street. That was one of the names of one of the uh, uh, books written about the case. At any rate, the Israeli agents from the Mossad, remember the Mossad is the external agency of the Israeli intelligence. Shin Bet is the internal. At any rate, they look at this decrepit house before its roof. It's plywood, plywood, or what do you call it? Wallboard, whatever, no running water, no electricity. How could Adolf Eichmann be the guy that's living? So they begin to watch him. They take pictures of Eichmann, and I don't quite understand the physiology, but somehow from a person's ears, the way the ears are, you can identify. But more importantly, remember March the 21st? It was Eichmann's anniversary. They're watching Eichmann, and he goes and buys a dozen roses on March the 21st. The next picture, please. That was his anniversary. That was the key. Isser Harel, founder of the Mossad, he develops this complete operational plan to capture Eichmann. The biggest problem they have is how are they going to get him out of Argentina? And the next picture, please. At this time, they weren't using jet planes as airliners. Uh, they initiated a Bristol Britannia flight, and Abba Eben, who knew nothing about the Argentina, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Argentina's uh, and that was a good cover. So Eben 
left on a different flight, obviously, but he knew nothing about it. And the next picture, please. They had a lot of difficulty in Argentina with the language. They needed a safe house. They had to rent cars. The cars were decrepit. They had to give a $5,000 deposit in 1960 to get a car. They fixed the cars so they could change the license plate. They devised a secret compartment in the safe house, and they brought with them an anesthetologist, a medical doctor who would anesthetize Eichmann. And the next picture, please. So they had some surveillance and so forth. And the next picture, please. The way they did it, they, they had watched Eichmann carefully. And I have to just tell you another little personal thing. I was giving the same lecture in Florida. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the lecture, and I, I'm sorry, it's one of my faults. I don't like interruptions in the middle of my lecture. So a man stands up and he says, I knew him. I says, well, let, let's get to it at the end. So at the end of the lecture, I said, well, how did you know him? Who did you know? He says, I knew Ricardo Clement. This man who I'm friends with in Florida, an older gentleman, he's now in his 90s, he was selling tires. He had a very good rubber business. He was selling tires to Mercedes-Benz. And at this point, Eichmann was a purchasing agent for Mercedes-Benz buying tires from this Jewish man. I don't mind telling his name. His name is Paul Simko. So Paul Simko had been selling tires. And one day he comes home from work and his wife is reading the main Buenos Aires newspaper. And there's a huge picture of Adolf Eichmann and Ricardo Clement on the banner headline of, of the Buenos Aires newspaper. Paul Simcoe looks at the picture and faints dead away on the floor. And his wife revives him and gets him up and says, what happened? What is wrong? He says, I've been selling tires to this man for six months, Adolf Eichmann. Well, let me just describe the actual capture. They knew, they cased Eichmann. He had very humble uh, surroundings, as I mentioned. He had this humble job. He took the bus and he had to walk several hundred yards from the bus to his home. They positioned two cars on the street. One car had the headlight shining at the way Eichmann was coming and the other car was on the other side of the street. They had the hood up uh, on the car without the headlights and they pretended to be fixing something in the car. As Eichmann approached, Peter Malkin and another agent grab Eichmann. Eichmann begins to struggle. And uh, Malkin, who has judo, knocks Eichmann on the back of the neck, knocks him unconscious. They stuff him into the car, and away they go. And they keep him in this safe house in a, in a secret compartment for almost a week till they can fly him out. And of course, they did not want to let the Argentinian authorities know they had a backup on this in case the Argentinians were to, to interfere in any way, that they were to uh, hang up themselves to Eichmann and uh, complain that the, they captured this war criminal. They were really quite afraid. Remember, Argentina ha had some very fascist leanings. They didn't declare war on uh, Germany until I think May 1945, just before it was over. Okay, the next picture, please. Here he is on the plane. Uh, the plane only had the agents and support staff. He was anesthetized. They pretended he was drunk. They carried him onto the plane on a stretcher and they put uh, blinders on him. And a couple of the agents, I mean, it was quite a team to do this, a couple of the agents walked up to first class where I was sitting, uh, I guess, tousled up and blinkered and so forth. But don't forget it was a long flight. And they had all issues with the flight. They didn't want to land for refueling and so forth. At any rate, 
some of the agents had to come up and they had to look at this man. They just couldn't believe what they had done. The next picture, please. So May the 23rd, 1960, David Ben-Gurion announces that one of the most important war criminals had been captured. And you know, Israeli politics are very, very fractionated. And for the whole Knesset to stand up and applaud was really something. And I think besides the political things and declaring a state and so forth, I think this was a phenomenal thing that Ben-Gurion had done to make this trial because he realized by 1960, 15 years after the war, the Israeli youth don't understand what happened to the Jewish people and how important it is. So he wanted to make this a trial. I had a big fight with one professor. He called it a show trial. I can't really go along with that. A, a show trial really has a connotation of a, an innocent person. This was not an innocent person. And we have the next picture, please. And now we get to the trial, it began April the 11th, 1961. And the next picture, please. They put him in a glass box. All of the guards and all the people that dealt with him were of Sparty background. I mean, the Sparty designation in Israel is gone, but, but they didn't want people from Eastern Europe who probably had lost relatives and so forth. They were the ones who guarded him. They watched him day and night. They didn't want him to commit suicide. They wanted a proper trial. And the next picture, please. The trial, as I mentioned, was held in, in uh, Bet Haim, which was a newly built building. They had radio coverage and uh, the symbols, and we talked about that at the beginning. Those are the three judges. And the next picture, please. This is the location of the trial. Uh, it was jam-packed. You couldn't get in. Uh, the next picture, please. Gideon Hausner was the acting as Israeli Attorney General. He was the Chief Prosecutor. Uh, we had his daughter come and talk about the trial at Beth Sedek a couple of years ago. And the next picture, please. He had a defense. It was completely conducted as a proper trial. Now, there were five, actually, if you think about it, there were five good legal points if you're into legalities. Eichmann is captured illegally. Eichmann's crimes were committed before the state of Israel existed. Israel had no jurisdiction uh, on this. Israel did not exist as a state when the crimes were committed. And the judges in the state are all biased. So Servatius, who had also served as a lawyer at the Nuremberg trial, did a reasonable job for this horrendous monster. Next picture, please. Golda Meir had to go to the United Nations to apologized to Argentina. And they apologized and it, it was finally dealt with. It's unbelievable that she had to go to the United Nations to apologize. And the next picture, please. As I mentioned, it was a tremendous thing that Ben-Gurion did. Uh, you have to remember for the first 15 years of the state from 19 or 12 years from 1948 to 1960, Israel was trying to make its way. They fought a victorious war in 1956, but still they had a tremendous, without German reparations, which certainly Germany had to do, but without those German rep reparations, it's doubtful if Israel would have survived initially. It was very, very difficult. So Ben-Gurion used this trial as a Holocaust teaching trial. In the next picture, please. 
And again, if you look at Eichmann, he looks like, as Hannah Arendt, he does not look like an evil man here. And it became a tremendous news story. Correspondents came from all over the world it, uh, to write about this. And Hannah Arendt uh, writes a uh, series of articles in the Atlantic magazine, I believe, the one that uh, Mer uh, David Frum is the editor of. Um, I, I could, can be corrected on that. Anyways, she writes a series of stories about Eichmann, Eichmann in Jerusalem. I have to tell you, uh, a lot of people vehemently disagreed with all of her conclusions about, she coined the phrase, the banality of evil. You can see how she came upon that looking at Eichmann but some of her thoughts were not proper. Okay, the next picture, please. This is one of the prosecution witnesses. He, he had been a presiding judge at the Nuremberg trial. He became a witness for the prosecution and he quoted Hermann Goring. Goring uh, committed suicide while he was awaiting execution. Um, that's a whole other story. And Goring said, Eichmann was the man to determine in what order and what countries the Jews were to die. And the next picture, please. And here's Her Her Herman Goring, who, as I mentioned, committed suicide. He had a cyanide capsule smuggled into him. Didn't want to be hung. And the next picture, please. This scene from Schindler's List, and I think all of you have seen it. You remember this scene where there's a little girl in a red coat, and it was the only color that Steven Spielberg used in the movie Schindler's List. And he took that from the testimony of uh, one of the witnesses, a lot of the witnesses. Now, almost none of the witnesses could really say very much about Eichmann. They were all survivors. They were all talking about the Holocaust. And one man recounted how his daughter was taken away and he watched her fade away in the distance. And this, I guess, Steven Spielberg, who is a genius in the cinema, I think he, he must have watched the testimony and he was taken by this, how this man saw his little daughter walking away to her death and if you see the little girl in red, she slowly disappears. And later in the movie, Schindler's List, you see her laying on a pile of corpses dead. So that's where that came from. Okay. Quite a number of the witnesses collapsed and cried. Next picture, please. And here are the three faces of Eichmann. And again, he looks so sinister in the middle picture. And at the trial, he doesn't look so serious. And the next picture, please. Well, this phrase has resonated through history. I was only following orders. Whatever the Fuhrer said, I had to do. But it was well proven. He well went well beyond that. As I mentioned in Hungary, he told um, <laughs> Raoul Wallenberg, he told Raoul Wallenberg, there's some Jews here, I have to make sure they're all looked after. So that, that went. Next picture, please. The Israeli government invited a number of ex-Nazis, uh, they, they gave them total immunity if they'd come to Israel to testify. Of course, none of them did, but some of them had sent depositions and they supported Eichmann. I'm sorry, they didn't support Eichmann. They said Eichmann was a salter bird. So Eichmann abused his authority and went beyond what he should have. So that was very little testimony from any Nazis or Germans. Next picture, please. So here's the final sequence of events. August the 14th, 14 weeks of trial and testimony. People were crying. 
It was very difficult. For it. We have to remember there were about 300,000 Holocaust survivors in Israel at this time. Very difficult uh, for the country to follow this. The 7th, the 11th, 1961, the three judges complete their deliberation, guilty on all 15 counts. December the 15th, he's sentenced to death. In the next picture, please. They go through the whole legal process. All appeals are rejected by the Israeli Supreme Court and the Israeli president turns down the Eichmann petition for mercy. And on June the 1st, 1962, he's hanged by two people simultaneously they wanted to make sure the actual executioner was unknown. And the next picture, please. Uh, th this uh, we could have done without, but uh, this Mexican comic book pictured uh, Eichmann being hung. And the next picture, please. Eichmann's final words were, long live Germany, long live Austria, Long live Argentina. I will never forgive him. In his last meal, he didn't ask for any food. He had half a bottle of caramel wine, red wine. In the next picture, please. He was cremated and the ashes were put in an urn. They were taken out and scattered at sea so there would be no memorial ever for future neo-Nazis. If you follow German politics, unfortunately the far right was raising its deadly head again in Germany. Not in a huge way, but it is there. The next picture. Hannah Arendt. I, I, I really do not have a lot of respect for her. Apparently during the trial, other journalists said she went to the French Riviera. She didn't want to sit in Israel. She felt it was, she is Jewish by the way, she felt it, it was a first third world country. And one of the things she came out with in her articles in the Atlantic magazine was that the Judenrat, the Jewish councils had collaborated with the Nazis and helped with Jewish extermination. Of course it's true, but none of them could grasp what was going on and what were they to do. And the Judenrat, the Jewish councils is a whole spectrum for instance, in Lodz, uh, the uh, head of the Judenrat in Lodz, Chaim Ronkowski, uh, he, he sacrificed the men and women because he said the Nazis needed the workers. So he sent away the men and women, the, not the men, the women and the children to be exterminated, knowing they were going to be exterminated. Later on, when he's sent to his death, he's beaten to death, by the Jewish inmates at Auschwitz. Uh, so that was one spectrum. Other heads of Judenrat committed suicide. Uh, his name escapes me for a minute, but the um, leader of the Warsaw Ghetto, he commits suicide on July the 22nd when they deport the people to, to Treblinka. Uh, other people resisted. So there was a whole spectrum for her to make this phrase that the Judenrat, the Jewish councils were responsible, was very bad. Next picture, please. This is the last picture. Thank you, Marnie. It was a lot of slides. Adolf Eichmann is perceived as the embodiment of evil. He remains today the only person ever executed by the state of Israel. Now, one rabbi told me there was, in the 1948 war, somebody was court-martialed and killed. Uh, that may have been the only execution. But to draw a parallel, uh, Halevi, um, the assassin of Yitzhak Rabin, he's still alive, he's allowed to vote, he has he married, he has conjugal visits, he sends the life. His Yorama um, will come to me in a minute. Uh, at any rate, the assassin of Yitzhak Rabin, conjugal rights, living still, uh, even had a child. Uh, 
So basically the only person that, and that is the end of the slides.